Uh, Well, now as we come to the reading and preaching of God's word, uh, will you turn with me in your Bibles uh, to the end of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and we'll read verse 8 through the end of the chapter. Uh, So this is the last of our series on the book of Ecclesiastes, and in many ways is going to form a bit of a summary and conclusion to uh, what the Lord has to teach us through this wonderful book. So Ecclesiastes, and we'll start reading at verse 8. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of all the, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now will you pray with me now for the Lord's blessing on this time? Well, Lord God Almighty, uh, we trust that now during this time uh, you are, are at work for your own glory, Lord, and for Uh, the good and spiritual welfare of your people. Lord, even though we can't meet as we usually uh, would, yet, Father, your word remains powerful, it remains authoritative, it remains true, and we pray that you would use it powerfully in our lives and in our hearts during this time. And, Lord, we are aware that we live in a world that denies you and has rejected you, Lord, a world that every day tells us there is no God and that there is nothing to live for beyond the present. So, Father, we pray that your word would cut through these lies in our hearts and in our minds, and, Lord, that you would teach us to live by faith. And, Father, we know and I have no doubt that Satan also will be at work during this time, uh, doing all that he can to make your word ineffective in our lives and hearts. So Lord, would you restrain him and instead would your word bear fruit in our lives and in our hearts. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, well, I wonder how you have found our journey through the book of Ecclesiastes. It's quite a different sort of book, isn't it? Uh, It's has quite a different feel than other Psalms or Romans or John. It's got a different voice, a different tone to it. Now, one commentator put it like this. He said, Ecclesiastes is a little bit like a crazy man that's sitting on a corner downtown. He's dressed in rags. He's got a big, unkempt beard. And he looks like he hasn't bathed for weeks And he kind of smells like it too. And as you walk past him, uh, he just glares at you and begins to yell at you uh, that your life is built on illusions and you're all going to die. And the commentator uh, notes that when faced with such a person, uh, many of us choose to walk in a less dreary part of town. And there's some truth to that, isn't there? Uh, That Ecclesiastes is very much Uh, a hard-hitting book, in many ways a somewhat pessimistic book. Uh, When I first told my wife, Amy, that I was thinking of preaching through the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, one of the first things she told me was that it was a book which suited my personality. So you can take that as you will. Uh, But there is some truth to it, isn't there? Uh, That Ecclesiastes does suit a cup-half-full people. It kind of rolls off the tongue of the pessimist. A vanity of vanities. All is vanity. 
But I hope you've been able to see as we've worked our way through this book uh, that it's not only pessimistic, but it's also deeply and fundamentally unnecessary. Unnecessary for our hearts and our souls and our desires. Unnecessary to shatter illusions so that we would seek truth. Necessary to shatter false sources of happiness so that we might be led to the one true and lasting joy. And here in this passage that we've just read together, uh, we get the final word, the ultimate conclusion. Now this is what brings it all together. And so this morning we're not just going to be thinking about this passage, but really we want to think together about the whole book of Ecclesiastes and what the message is that God has for us as his people today. Now, Because the destination only makes sense if you remember the journey. And the answer only resonates if you understand the question. And so firstly, we're going to think about the question of Ecclesiastes, and then we're going to think about the answer. So firstly, what is the question of Ecclesiastes? So if you look down at verses 9 downward, uh, they seem to be describing what sort of man the preacher is, uh, this man who has been our guide for these last number of weeks. And it reinforces that he is uh, a wise and godly sage. Uh, He is a man with much knowledge and wisdom. And it reinforces a theme that it's touched on again and again, that wisdom is advantageous. Uh, that we need wisdom deeply uh, to live in an uncertain world. And if you look with me at verse 11, it goes on to say this. It says, The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. And now a goad was a stick that had a pointed iron end, and you'd use it to prod cattle, Uh, to make them go in the right direction. And the point that he's saying is that the words of the wise are like a cattle prod to prod us in the right direction, and like a nail that is firmly fixed and established. Now that actually wherever we find wisdom, uh, we are to recognize that it is given by God, uh, the one shepherd. So if you jump back up to verse 8, Uh, the verse that we read to start with, and hopefully you picked up that this is the exact same, really the exact same uh, verse as the one in Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 2 that George read for us. And it says this, it says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. And really these are kind of like the bookends of Ecclesiastes uh, that hold the whole book together. And as he comes to the end of his quest, uh, the preacher has been searching for ultimate meaning and ultimate joy. And his search has taken him high and low, uh, near and far. It's taken him to the temple and to the marketplace, uh, to the law court and to the cemetery. Uh, He's searched out life under the sun and all of its various aspects, uh, its beauty and its sorrow. Uh, It's paradoxes and and it's enigmas, Uh, injustice and justice, life and death. And the wall that he constantly finds himself against is that damning sentence, a vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Uh, Certainly he's found throughout this book that there are plenty of things that can distract us or that can give us a momentary pleasure or satisfaction. And there are so many things that we can chase after in this life. Uh, We can chase after knowledge. We can chase after power. We can chase after our wisdom. We can chase after riches. We can chase after possessions or men and women. But the preacher has taught us that actually it's like trying to grab the wind in your hands. Uh, You try and grab it, but there's nothing there to grab, and you're left with empty hands. It's like a breath on a cold winter's morning that hangs there for a moment and then is gone. It's elusive, it's temporary, it's passing, you can't grab it. 
He's looked in so many places for meaning and for joy. And really, reading through the book of Ecclesiastes, and I hope you have read through it in uh, one sitting at one point or another, is a little bit like reading down a list uh, where everything is crossed off. And you read through it and pleasure, vanity. Hard work, vanity. Uh, Virtue, vanity. Uh, Life, vanity. Death, vanity. Uh, All is vanity. And he keeps coming back to this point again and again that in the end there is nothing under the sun which can satisfy the human heart or give us true meaning and joy. In the 1960s, there was a play released uh, by Samuel Beckett, and the, same, and the play was called Breath. And it was a very short play. Uh, the whole play only lasted about 30 seconds, and there were no words spoken and no actors used. But what happened in this little play is that at the very start, uh, the whole stage is dark. You can't see anything. And then you hear uh, this cry of a newborn child. And slowly the stage is lit up, and you see this huge pile of rubbish uh, that litters the stage. And then you hear this kind of rasping human breath. And then then the light is taken away, and everything goes back to darkness. And it's a somewhat... uh, pessimistic or um, confronting play, but actually that's very much what the preacher has been telling us all along, that actually if there is nothing beyond life under the sun, then actually that's all that our lives are, just a passing breath, here now and gone in a moment. And so actually a vital part of the message Uh, that God has for us as his people today, it's a warning that actually if you're trying to build your life on anything uh, under the sun, then you're building on smoke. You're building on wind. And it will not ultimately satisfy you. Uh, It can't uh, fill the void or heal the ache within your heart. Because actually it's not what you're looking for. And I hope, brothers and sisters, that you can see just what an important and vital message this is for us today. That as we live in a a deeply materialistic culture, a culture that's obsessed with looks and appearances and money and possessions, uh, the preacher is telling us that actually joy is not found there. Are there false paths, dead ends? And I really, I hope and pray that throughout this series, uh, that you've been forced to consider your own life and your own heart. That you've been forced to ask yourself, actually, uh, where am I looking for meaning in my life? Where am I looking for uh, ultimate joy? I've found that often throughout these last number of weeks as I've been preaching through Ecclesiastes, and especially during this lockdown period, uh, there's been a sense in which I wish I could look you directly in the eye uh, rather than just looking at this little, computer, this little computer screen because actually it's meant to be our soul searching. The Ecclesiastes is meant to uncover our idols uh, to show us where it is that we're ultimately looking for meaning and purpose. And so I hope that it hasn't been uh, merely interesting but at least in some aspects, that it's been confronting and convicting. Ecclesiastes is a little bit like uh, those scanners that they sometimes use in airports, uh, where you walk through the metal detector, and then sometimes they take you aside. You have to put up your arms, and they get the scanner, and they scan your whole body uh, to see if there is any metal. And the scanner beeps uh, wherever metal's found. And Ecclesiastes does the same thing, really. It scans our hearts and our lives, and it beeps uh, wherever there is an idol, wherever there is something under the sun in which we are putting our ultimate value and worth in. And so I wonder what the scan has showed for you, brothers and sisters. 
I wonder this morning where it is that you're looking for ultimate joy and meaning in your life. I wonder if it beeped. You see, it doesn't matter how fast you're running if you're running in the wrong direction. And it's better to be crawling in the right direction than sprinting in the wrong one. And so as we come to the end of Ecclesiastes, we're really left saying, ah, well, if not that, then what? Ah, if joy and meaning isn't found in any of these things under the sun, then where is it found? Where may we find it? So firstly, the question of Ecclesiastes, and now secondly, the answer of Ecclesiastes. And so it's quite important to realize that uh, without this passage that we've just read, and especially verses 12 through 14, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes would be incomplete. That everything has been driving to this point, uh, driving us to despair over life under the sun, so that we may learn to look above the sun. And up to this point, the only conclusion he's been able to consistently reach is vanity of vanities. And nothing under the sun can rise above meaninglessness. But now he is forced uh, to come back actually to God and to his word. And so if you read verse 13 with me, this is really the summary of the whole book or the conclusion of the whole book of Ecclesiastes where it says, The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. And interestingly, this is the only place in the whole book of Ecclesiastes that he talks about God's commandments, now that what life under the sun cannot teach him, God's word reveals to him. And so he says, actually, fear God and keep his commandments. That's where life is found. That's where joy flows. That's where meaning abides. And so very practically, do you want to know what uh, your life ought to be? Do you want to know what your heart is searching for? Uh, what isn't vanity? Uh, then you have your answer. Fear God and keep his commandments. Enter into loving relationship with the God who made you and walk in his ways. Know him through his son and uh, obey him through his spirit. And what does it mean to fear God? Well, it means knowing him. It means bowing down before his majesty. It means being humbled by his greatness. And actually, throughout Ecclesiastes and in this part of the Bible, actually, this is uh, what the righteous do. Uh, that fearing God isn't so much uh, an action you perform as it describes a type of person. And so maybe you find yourself thinking, ah, well, how do I know, James, if, if I'm a God-fearer? How do I know if I'm that sort of person? And maybe actually some diagnostic questions will be helpful. Maybe you could even just note these down and spend some time later this afternoon thinking and praying through them. And actually ask yourself, uh, do I have times in my life of being humbled by God's greatness? Uh, do I care about whether what I do pleases God or displeases Him? Do I try and have a yearning to walk in God's ways? Uh, do I have a desire deep in my heart to, to bring pleasure to Him throughout uh, my life? And actually, if you look at your own life and you find that actually no, I don't really care whether what I do pleases God or not. Actually, I, I don't really care all that much about trying to walk in his ways. Uh, then maybe you don't know him. But actually, if you find within yourself that actually you're deeply grieved, that you wish that your life was more like that of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have this yearning that actually I wish my life pleased God more, and I hate that there's so much sin and so much that displeases God, then actually you are this type of person. But it's not just a type of person that it's describing here, but it's a type of life. 
I fear God and obey his commandments. Uh, A train is never more free than when it's on the tracks. A fish is never more free than when it's swimming in the ocean. And a Christian is never more free or content than when he's walking in God's ways. I'm sure you know the words of the old hymn, I trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. And I hope that I've explained this in such a way that you can see that actually this message, this conclusion to Ecclesiastes is no different from the message that the New Testament proclaims. That Ecclesiastes drives us to Jesus and shows us that he is all we need and all that we desire. It shows us that actually until we know Christ and are living in a joyous relationship with him, are we stuck on the treadmill of existence, are lost in the maze of futility. And actually Jesus is the only way we ever can fear God and walk in his commands. It's only through Jesus that we can enter into a relationship and friendship with God. And it's only through the ministry of his Holy Spirit uh, that we can ever walk in the fear of God or obey his commands. And if you look down at these final verses, It gives us two powerful motivations to fear God and walk in his ways. And if you look at the end of verse 13, it says this, Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Or in the original language, it's literally, for this is the whole of man. And the point is that actually this is what God requires of you, and this is what you were designed for. Are you were made to know God and to walk in his ways? And actually, if you aim your life at obedience and living the type of life that God wants you to live, I can promise you that you will not regret it on the last day. I can promise you on the authority of the words of the living God that this is what your heart yearns for. This is what you were made for. And actually, that's been uh, my own experience as well. A huge turning point in my own faith uh, came at around the age of 18. Uh, When I came to realize that it's not just that I ought to serve God because that's the right thing to do, but instead I came to realize that I ought to serve God because he's the only one that can satisfy me. Uh, He is the one that I was made to know, uh, that knowing him and being in relationship with him uh, is the very purpose for which I was made, and the very purpose for which you were made as well. I remember the very well-known first question and answer, uh, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. And I trust and hope that uh, many of you have experienced this in your own life, Uh, that you've tasted personally uh, that the Lord is good, Uh, that you know uh, within your heart and within your experience that you were made for him, and that knowing him is your deepest joy. I think we might have mentioned it before, but um, the old church father, St. Augustine, he started his spiritual autobiography with the words, "Uh, you've made us for yourself. And our heart is restless until it finds rest in you. So the first uh, motivation to fear God and work, walk in his ways is, brothers and sisters, this is what you are made for. This will be your deepest source of joy. This will be, uh, this is the very purpose for which you are made. And the second motivation, uh, we find in verse 14, where it says, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. And it's a reality of judgment. Now, the reality that actually God is going to bring are all things into judgment. And the bar of his judgment is going to be this very thing, a fearing God and walking in his ways. You see, on that final day when you have to stand before God Almighty, You're not going to be judged for how much money you made. You're not going to be judged for how many houses you owned. You're not going to be judged for uh, how comfortable you were in this present life. 
but you're going to be judged on whether you feared God and walked in his ways. And so the final word of Ecclesiastes is not that nothing matters, but actually that everything matters. Now that every part of your life is going to be uh, judged by God Almighty, the judge of all the earth. And that actually what you do matters deeply and how you do it and why you do it. You see, our lives are astoundingly meaningful before God. And that can either be a wonderful uh, or a terrifying thought. Now, one writer expressed it like this, that actually the moment you were born, uh, God pressed the record button. And the moment you die, uh, God is going to press the stop button, then rewind and play. And actually, for the Christian, this is a hope-filled reality. Now, that because of Christ Jesus, we no longer have to fear the judgment. I'm sure you know that well-known verse of Romans 8.1, now that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It means that actually... Uh, for the Christian, the judgment means that what we do has value. It has worth. It's going to be shown in eternity. Uh, that no good deed done in the name of Christ will ever be forgotten or overlooked. But every act of grace will be uh, rewarded with a crown of grace. And so as we think about the judgment, we can do so with uh, great confidence because Christ has stood in our place. And that actually the judgment is going to be the final vindication of God's people. Now there's so many hidden deeds of the saints that uh, we quickly forget or that we never see. Uh, a kind word spoken to a brother or sister, an earnest prayer prayed, uh, a time of turning away from temptation, a uh, decision made uh, with the intent of pleasing God, uh, so often we forget about these, or other people never see them. But God sees, and God's going to reward. We read the verse uh, last week in 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, where it says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, uh, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain, and that the good works of a Christian are never in vain. But for the non-Christian, actually this is a fearful judgment. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, and if you haven't uh, repented and given your life to him, then actually you need to know that everything you've ever said and thought and done and desired is going to be brought before the divine jury. And there's going to be no hiding and no masks on that day, but only bare and naked truth. And so this becomes both a warning and an invitation that if you don't know God, and if you're not walking in his ways, I then seek him while he may be found. That if delight and duty won't move you to seek him, I then let this reality move you uh, to desire him that one day you will stand before him and everything that you have ever done I will be given a verdict by the righteous and holy God. And so actually, brothers and sisters, and all who are listening to this, actually, wherever you're on in your spiritual journey, wherever your heart is at, I fear God and obey his commandments. Know God by his Son and in his spirit, I repent of sin and bow the king, your knee to King Jesus. You see, it's not only your deepest need, but it will be your deepest joy. Because Christ is the one place where everything isn't vanity. Where everything isn't just elusive and temporary. But he's the one place of solid joy. The one place of lasting meaning. The one place of endless pleasures. And so as we come to an end of this sermon and this uh, book, I hope that you've been able to see that actually every line of this book is designed to lead us to the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to show us that actually he is the one we are seeking. 
He is the one that we were made for. And that nothing else, no matter how grand, no matter how expensive, no matter how hard-earned, will ever satisfy our hearts. And so as we do come to a close, I hope that you will uh, often come and revisit the slightly strange but deeply important book. But really, I hope more than that. I hope and pray that you know are that actually in Jesus Christ, everything isn't vanity. That you see and know, even just a little bit more, that Jesus Christ himself is everything you need, everything you desire, that he is your identity, he is your wisdom, he is your pleasure, and he himself is your life. You have made us for yourself, And our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Now, will you pray with me now, brothers and sisters? Well, Lord God Almighty, you are the true and living God. And Father, you are the one that we were made for. Lord, you know that that's the reason why we find so many things in this life hollow and empty and unsatisfying is that we were made for something so much bigger than anything this world could ever give us. And so, Lord, we pray for each and every one of our hearts. We pray that you would shatter illusions and lies. We pray that you would uncover idols and areas in our lives where we are trusting in the wrong thing. And we pray that you would help us to be individuals and a church uh, that fears you and that walks in your commandments. Lord, thank you for Christ Jesus. And we pray that we would increasingly know uh, the reality of the joy that is found in him. So please come, Lord, and may your word produce its proper harvest in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Are we going to?